I just want to say a few things, because for me, given the recent events that reflect a country at dis-ease with itself, it is my contention that we don't have to look far to analyze the fault lines in our ailing democracy. And in doing so, come to terms with the fact that whilst we try to deal with the past through various mechanisms, inclusive of the TRC, we're still very far from laying the ghost of the past to rest. So we're still feeling the ghost of the past. It would appear that the system put in place by our government, which were intended to consolidate the gains of South Africa's transition into democracy, into a democratic state, and ensure a peaceful coexistence, have not done the trick. Instead of implementing reparations which were meant to restore the dignity post the TRC process, the government sought to use reconstruction and development program to address socio-economic disadvantages. We now know very well that this has not addressed the many wounds caused by social, economic and marginalization which continue to haunt the poorest of the poor. The service delivery protests that often culminate in the destruction of property and loss of lives are perhaps a testimony to the failure of the RDP. Then there was the moral regeneration movement, which is about the role of spirituality in all of this, which was set up to address the problem of spiritual malaise, particularly with relation to corruption, violence in interpersonal relations and families, <coughs> shameful records of abuse of women and children in our society, but this has not also been the balm to soothe the soul of South Africa's gaping wounds as was envisaged. Not much is said about the social cohesion process, which was meant to assist citizens foster inclusiveness, collaboration and national building around common values. The new key on the block now is the national development plan. And so we go. So for me, perhaps the failures in our country is the disconnect. It is the disconnect between what communities would like to see, what communities feel is their pain, and what gets parachuted from outside as solutions that are dreamed by people outside of those communities and outside of what hurts. For me, there's a misfit between what communities need and what we sometimes want to do. The fragmentation of the communities through years of victimization has also caused what we're sitting on. I happen to believe that the language we use, which was what Brendan talked about, is perhaps what alienates communities from the solutions we bring forth. And the language we refuse to use, the indigenous knowledge systems and their wealth of knowledge and I can give examples of how sometimes just using the language gets people to understand exactly what you're talking about. And we've gone away from that. The denigration of the cultural practices of our people has been part of the problem while we're not getting far. And the fact that what comes naturally is seen as problematic, what people believe as the solutions that they want to is also one of the major, major, major problems we're sitting with. Now, in opening this, for me, perhaps the question we need to ask ourselves as a nation of South Africa is, can we afford to open our hearts beyond our wounds in order to source the wisdom and compassion within? <coughs> Indications are that the rage and anger we collectively carry, and I include myself in that as a nation, will soon consume and destroy us. And we're sitting at a precipice where there's a gathering of clowns. The young generations are at dis-ease. There's a sense that something is moving. The generation of 1976 got this government to its knees. And I think the generation today is also going to be asking some questions, some tough questions of our leaders. And we're sitting in that. And I think the question is, what are we going to do about it? I reflected on the table that we seem to know what we are here for. But the question is, how do we make it work? How do we take these wonderful ideas about culture and allow people to speak their truth about, you know, sitting and listening silently and being able to garner the wisdom from the bottom up 
How do we use that? How do we do that? We say these things all the time, we come again and we say it again. But how is it implemented so that we can go on with the healing process? So in those short words, I'd like to um, introduce the panel. And you've got their bios in this wonderful book here. The first person who's going to speak is Teresa Alvinen, uh, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of South Africa, African History Department and a research associate at Rose University. Then we'll follow with, no, sorry, sorry, you're the second, you're the second speaker. Yes. The first speaker is Nomfundo, who's my name, Muhati, who's currently the executive director of the Center for Study of Violence and Translation. Welcome. And then the last person who's going to speak is Shelly Gan, who's the director of the Human Rights Center based in Cape Town. And you can read this to get more information. <coughs> So, on that note, I'd like to get Mufunga to start us off. Thank you. We might need to know that Because we are both Mufundos, but... <laughs> okay, so if, um, if Pumla and Brandon said it was pleasant to be here, I'd just multiply that by 10. Because not only am I amongst people who are experts in the field, but amongst people that I looked up to as a growing profession, a professional, Nomfundo, Pumla, Brandon. But not only that, now I've learned that I've got three minutes less than my time. <laughs> so, we're going to try and do this. And I'll try not to be too fast because I do that when I'm concerned about time. So I think it, it, it is an open secret that the, the fault lines to our democracy in South Africa have deepened and are deepening since the 26 years when we achieved our democracy. And there is rich learnings for us on the role of psychosocial interventions and discourse and what role it should play or should didn't play in building durable peace. So what I'll be doing today is to look at the learning that we've had as an organization that has engaged with these issues for the past 25 years through having a, a trauma clinic that works with victims to working in communities, but also through sh trying to create social change through the advocacy work that we do. So some of the key learnings I think that we can take out as social, social practitioners to say, what are the things that we need to do in other countries and other contexts so that we don't find ourselves in the same situation that South Africa is in is the one learning that we learned when we did research with ex-combatants in South Africa and we we're trying to look at the impact that we had made as psychosocial practitioners in working with them over a period of seven years. And when we asked them and said, what is the difference that the interventions have made in your life? Their your answer was, they made no difference. <laughs> you can imagine then our reaction as psychosocial professionals. But when we dig deeper, they said, yes, of course, we, we talk better with our children, we've got better relationships, but our lived experiences have not changed. I'm still worrying about whether my children are going to have bread or not. So the issue of the interconnectedness between unresolved trauma and socioeconomic exclusion has continued to be a thread in the work that we do. And we therefore learned that if we are to implement uh, psychosocial interventions, the two have to work together. Because healing is not sufficient if people's lived conditions have not changed. But at the same time, we know that even if you can bring a lot of social, economic um, upliftment for people, and woundedness and unresolved trauma actually sabotages those initiatives. Mm -hmm. So what therefore means is that as psychosocial interventionists, if we want to build durable peace, we have to start to speak to people who speak a different language from us. We have to start engaging with the, with the people we engage with social economic issues um, in our society. But also we have to start using a language because I think the struggle for the psychosocial field in South Africa was to build a business case 
force up for social interventions to really show those linkages as to why is it important that there are the linkages between the two. But not only that, what we are learning at a collective level is that some of the social ills that we are seeing in our society, and Novundo has touched on them, I mean, in South Africa, we have a 900% increase in collective violence since 2009. Um, the recent violence we've seen with xenophobia, we know that some of these issues are a direct link of the unresolved collective trauma that we've seen in our society and the unaddressed socioeconomic exclusion and marginalization in our society. So not dealing with these things when you're trying to build peace then they actually become a direct threat to the very peace that you are trying to build. The second thing, and um, uh, Pumla started a bit on it when she was talking about issues of leadership, and, and I think Fanny was talking about issues of morality and how you engage with the leadership, is that when you deal with issues of peace building, it's important to not only work with the woundedness of the marginalized, and I'm gonna put marginalized in inverted commas, but also the woundedness of the powerful. Mm. When we work in peace building, we tend to engage, and um, I'm not gonna talk about the, 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 the powerful in terms of, uh, for example, the white people and their guilt, because uh, Pumla has touched on that. But I wanna talk about this group who most of the time, they are activists who fought for the freedom and they end up being the leaders. So in South Africa, it would have been ANC. What you find with these people is that in peace building, we would engage with them around developing policies that will uh, provide social healing for the marginalized, but not saying in, de in developing a program for peace building, you must also develop a program for your own healing. Because mm -hmm. some of the challenges we had in South Africa is because we are led by wounded leaders. So for example, one of the key politics of ANC and the woundedness of ANC is that they had a very strong culture of solidarity. So solidarity and working together as, co as comrades was part of their survival. But because our leaders didn't get a chance to deal with their woundedness now, you find that in dealing with issues in society, as a society we don't understand why it's so much more important for you to have a relationship with Shabia Sheikhs beside what he's done in the midst of all the other challenges that we have. But also one of the politics within the ANC was the issue of um, the third force. Yeah? In order for the ANC to survive, they had to listen to the third force and to other people who are interfering. And what we're finding now is that with the issues of collective violence, as CSVR did a research which is called the smoke that calls, where the community says these people only listen to violence. But interestingly, even when the leaders listen to violence, the thing they tend to listen to is the third force. They'll tell you is, is the criminal elements, is the opportunist, and they are not able to listen to the underlying um, forces behind the violence. So if you don't address these issues and the woundedness of the leaders, it determines how they lead, it determines what they listen to, it determines what they respond to. And most of the issues that are happening in a society are a direct link to the woundedness of our own leaders. It's also important, um, as I said, to deal not that with the woundedness of the powerful and those in leaders, but of course the woundedness of the marginalized. Because we are realizing in South Africa that because we didn't deal with the woundedness and we didn't shift people's lived experiences, we've got a lot of people who are really angry and frustrated and what they are finding now is that on a daily basis, not only are they wounded and angry and frustrated, but they are engaging with those in power who continue, perpetu who continue to perpetuate the very same dehumanization that triggers the trauma that they had in the past. And that, of course, is going to feed into even more violence and threaten our democracy. So if you don't deal with both the woundedness of the powerful and the woundedness of the marginalized, then the interaction of this, which is the challenge we now have in South Africa 26 years later, is that you get a society of angry, frustrated, wounded people who are trying to fight for their survival and, and access to basic needs. And then you have a group of leaders who can't even hear and whose responses are inappropriate because they are responding from their woundedness. The other third thing that we need to focus on um, a peace building tends to focus on legal reform and institutional reform, which I think they are really important. But the learning that we've had as the people who work in the psychosocial field is the important 
role of the psychosocial practitioners to bridge the gap between the legal reform and the actual reform of the institutions themselves. And that is around um, dealing with what I call the organizational woundedness cultures. So what's happening in South Africa is that the very same institutions that I expected to support people, to strengthen democracy, your health institutions, your police institutions, your, your, your home affairs, they perpetuate the very same dehumanization that we are trying to deal with because there has been no shifts in the culture of these organizations. So it's not enough to just train them on human rights. It's about working with the leaders. And for us to do that work as psychosocial practitioners, we need to start using a different language. Because of course, if you want to go to leaders and say, we're going to deal with your woundedness, then they're going to say, what are, you, what are you talking about? So what we've started to do, for example, in the Department of Health is to say to them, no, we want to train you on leadership. Yeah, so we've got a program, we call it uh, Leadership and Wellness. Then in that training, we deal with their woundedness. And we've been so surprised at the level of woundedness that just the middle management managers of the Department of Health are actually carrying. So because they are wounded, they feel worthless and like they are nothing. They treat their, their nurses as if they are worthless and nothing. How do you expect the very same nurses to support the patients? And I think this is true all throughout the institutions in South Africa. So we really need to deal with that. Um, then I'm going to just for the next two minutes summarize the next ones. The, the, the other one, which is something really close to my heart, is that as an organization that has used to work at the trauma clinic and do one-on-one -on -one work, during the xenophobic attacks, there was a lot of inquiries to say, well, you psychologists, you work with these issues, tell us what is causing this. And we found that the individual approaches and explanations really didn't help. And in the past few years, we've been trying to engage with this issue of collective trauma, which I think is a very useful construct. Every time I use it, there won't be time to unpack it here, but it's been so useful to begin to help us and to help our society to understand some of the social ills that are taking place. And I would like to propose here that we really need as um, South African, as African and South African psychosocial practitioners to unpack this construct a bit more, to study it, to build on it, because every time I talk to people, it resonates and it makes sense to them. And then the final, um, the two final things for us which have been a learning um, is, is, is the issue of intergenerational trauma. That if you are to engage in peace building from day one, South Africa should have worked with children. And I think Mike explained the project of working with children um, so well. Because if we don't, then the unresolved traumatic memories that Pumla was talking about get transferred to the next generation and they try to undo the issues of the past. And instead of using their psychic energy to build society and to look at being functional um, members of our society, they find that they are trying to deal with this trauma and you find such high levels of violence that we have in our society. And then the final, final thing is that what we've learned at CSVR is if you are to really to make a change and a shift in terms of psychosocial healing. As psychosocial practitioners, you know when Umla was standing here and speaking, I was so touched. I had lots of things happening for me. I, 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 I had a lot of anxiety, fears, and all of that. And I just realized this work is so personal. And unless you've got people who are prepared to get in and do their own work, what happens is our own organizations tend to play out the issues we are trying to deal with. But if we deal with these issues, we become our own laboratory and we can help society to better be able to deal with these issues. And we really become an observing ego for society and help to interpret these issues. On that note, I'm done. <laughs> Note that she timed herself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will call on the next speaker so that we don't, you know, please keep your questions and your comments and your reflections. Thank you. Just a comment on generational issues. She might have timed herself with a cell phone. I have a watch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, just to begin by saying what an honour it is to be here. Thank you to um, both the Trauma Foundation and to IJR, but also to be part of this uh, remarkable <coughs> panel of women whose work I respect so much. Um, I come out of uh, having lived and worked in the Eastern Cape for the last 18 years, and I was deeply involved in 
a group of NGO practitioners as well as a, a group of academics who thought very deeply about development work and change and the role of people <coughs> who try to be change agents. And one of the things that um, has come up again and again is the way in which our work is intended to address problems. But the fact that we start working with problems means that the problems define us and our work. And I, I would argue that's been one of the greatest challenges in efforts to address the history and the violence and the legacies of colonial, colonialism and apartheid in South Africa. And so what, what I'd like to highlight, just as in the short time that, that I have, um, are a few themes and ideas and ways of working that absolutely resonate with the concerns and the issues that my colleagues have highlighted, but that are intended in some way to just slightly shift the lens and the way in which we frame and construct our work. Um, and the first, I'd like to begin by aligning myself very strongly with Pumla's emphasis on narrative work and the role of stories because while many people here in this room, including myself, have training in psychology, let's be honest, stories are humanity's oldest way of dealing with its issues. It's how conflicts have been dealt with, it's how wars have been, have been ended, it's also how wars have been begun, but it's also how families have resolved issues around tables, around fires, in collective and communal settings. And so my, I'm very deeply committed to honouring and working with stories. But I think in doing so, we need to recognise that we are but one generation of many, and that when we talk about time in the work that we're involved in, we need to stretch our minds way beyond the limit of our own memories and recognize the long-term histories that our work comes out of, but also the long-term histories that our work is shaping. That it's not only about addressing now, it's about thinking about the spaces that we are creating for a hundred years' time. And I'd like to use the building that we're in right now as an example. I don't know how many of you have read the history of this building, but it was the home of one of the, the leaders of colonialism and, and an agent of capitalist systems in this country in a very powerful way. And if you had told him a hundred years ago that a group like this would be sitting in this room, the ballroom, the ballroom <laughs> of our, and that the, the police union would be having a meeting down the corridor, I, I, it just would have been beyond his ability to conceive. And I think that's the point, is that the work we are doing is creating situations, relationships, ways of working that are going to go beyond anything we can conceive. And so what are we doing in this work and what are the anchors we need to use in this work? And um, one of the things that I've noticed most, I, I, so I started in the NGO sector, most recently my PhD research and, and work I've done out of that was with the white men who were conscripted into the, the apartheid-era army between 1968 and 1993. And, and part of the work that I've been involved in doing out of that, being an activist to the core of my being, is to initiate what, what we've called compassionate conversations between these soldiers and men who, during the time of the apartheid-era wars, as we call them, um, would have been their enemies, to listen to each other's stories. And one of the, there are two key ideas behind that notion of listening to stories of the other, or three, that, that I'd like to highlight, because I, I think there might be keys that can unlock some of our stuckness and some of our struggles. And the first is to understand that the way in which we as practitioners, as healers, as, as therapists of different kinds, as change agents, the way in which we work creates fields of energy and fields of memory. So what we invite into the spaces of our work is what is going to shape the way in which that work happens. I'm slightly repeating myself. But if we talk about people as being victims, as recipients of systematic or personal violence, whose agency in the midst of a situation of violence or in the process of making sense of that violence is not understood or respected, then that memory field is defined in fundamentally what I would argue is a dehumanizing way. Um, and so we need to be very careful in our work not to objectify or to label people. I really loved um, Mike's use of the word respect because I do think respect is a term that stretches across cultures and time. 
Um, and so, the, in, in narrative theory, they, they talk about memory fields that when they are politically controlled, and particularly when they're talking about memories of war, are often um, hegemonic and are predetermined. This is what may be told about what happened during the violence, and this is what may not. And if we're, if we're working towards change, are we shifting the memory fields, or are we simply recreating old hegemonic memory fields? And in creating those memory fields, what are, in the language of narrative theory, the discursive resources that we are drawing on in understanding the stories of our time? And one of the things I sense we have not done enough in South Africa is to understand how perceptions of threat are a discursive resource in all of our constructions of identities and the way in which we have conversations, the way in which we act. So, previously, depending on where you were during the apartheid regime politically, the threat was either the apartheid state or it was the liberation forces. And, and people, people's relationships with each other and people's identities were largely constructed within those, around those discursive resources. What, what the language of trauma has done, I would suggest, is to perpetuate the, this perception that we are under threat. So if someone who is perceived as a foreigner is a threat to my economic and social survival, I need to take them down because that's how the discursive resources function in the story of my community, my life, my nation. Um, and so an important part of what we need to be doing is identifying the common understandings that we draw on in constructing our, our personal, our relational, our communal and our national stories. Are those discursive resources, resources of healing, of transformation, of shifts into new ways of being? Or are we inadvertently just iterating old patterns of exclusion and of silencing. Um, I'd also like to just, while we're talking about trauma language, I don't know where we're running short of time, while we're talking about trauma language and time, I, I think that's a fundamental tension that we're dealing with because I, I, I speak out of my own experience of, of trauma in this as well, that, that an experience of violence that is potentially traumatic is overwhelming emotionally, and physically. And, and that experience stays in the present time. I mean, there are a lot of people who've written about trauma always staying in the present time. And so how does our work enable a moment that stays forever frozen um, in, in terms of the, the, the stark details of how it happened, how do we integrate that into the longer periods of time that we're trying to make sense of here? I think some of the tensions around that, and, and you talking about the woundedness of government leaders and the trauma, I've had the same experience. <coughs> With, it, with teachers, with officials, with leaders, in the Eastern Cape, that there's, there are these moments um, of frozenness in, in terms of the intensity. The frozenness is the intensity of an experience and the need for a safe space to, to be able to story it into something where I am an agent of change in my own story. We are agents of change in the story of our community. Um, and so I think that's another dimension in which time needs to be considered. Um, the time given to discussion of trauma, I mean, the way you began this morning's session. I'd also like, like to talk about the language of violence and trauma. How are we doing for time? I've got only three minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, the language of violence and trauma and, and this idea of the consequences. When, when dealing with generations who've lived through war, and I think South Africans have um, in, in different ways, then what, what happens is that the, the, that understanding of violence as a norm is all we have. And, and that, I, that graphic image we have of that young man stabbing um, the Mozambican man, or the, the way in which um, young people are struggling to move beyond what is necessary in the moment, that's partly an age issue. But I wonder if it's not also that there is a relationship between trauma and impunity that we haven't yet understood. Um, I think Giovanni Mangani began to write about it and he, he, I don't think he explored it enough. I, I think there's an important relationship between the psychology of impunity and its relationship with historical trauma over time that, that we've overlooked to our cost and that I think we need to look at again. Um, and I'd like to end by talking about 
the, our future and I, where I think we're going. I, like my colleagues, I am deeply concerned about South Africa and, and like Nomfunga, I also hark back to young people in the past. And in fact, I said to Alan just before we started that my qualitative feeling is that we're living in a time that's very similar to the late 1980s in South Africa, where violence is exploding, young people are in a different place to older people, leadership is losing moral courage and any sense of credibility, and things are cracking in ways that we have no understanding of, really, we will only understand it in retrospect, but that there are important moments where leadership is exercised and needs to be understood for what it is. And I'd like to speak very briefly about what's happened at the University of Cape Town and at Rhodes University in, in the last, I can't speak for this because I haven't had much experience of it, but I've, I've had some direct dealings with the young people who responded to that protest action of human excrement being show, thrown onto the statue of, of Rhodes at UCT and the way in which students at Rhodes University have picked up um, on the, the problematic name of Rhodes. Although, ironically, Rhodes University removed a statue of Cecil John Rhodes in 1992, I think it was, exactly anticipating the, these kinds of debates. What I'd like to say is that, yes, there have been a few individuals who've carried out radical, symbolic actions that could be described as violence. What the media has not focused on, and what I think we as transformation practitioners need to understand, is that there is a critical mass of young people who have been engaging in a level of debate and taking on senior academics in discussions about curriculum with an understanding of theory and methodology that has silenced the older generation. I believe that there is a significant body of leadership amongst young people who are angry in South Africa. The problem is we're not looking at them and we're not listening to them enough. And the storying that they are doing of their potential future is something we really should be standing in solidarity with. Um, and, and so I, I'd like to end on that note by saying I, I sympathize with my colleagues' feelings of fear. I feel them too. But as, as a child who lived through, as a young person in the 1980s, I also understand what it means for certain symbolic moments to be grasped and to be run with in a restoring process. And I sense we're at the beginning of that kind of moment in South Africa. with a bunch of psychologists this side. Um, you know, when we talk about this topic, um, dealing with our past, I, I want to just come closer into what past we're talking about. It's been touched on, but we have got the past in our country. We've got a colonial past, which we dare not touch much. And we've got an African and nationalist apartheid past, which was 56 years that we lived with, based on a Dutch word, apartheid, and um, that corroded the morality of this country in every way. It was racial capitalism, it was not just racism. So we're sitting in the ballroom, having a dance, and I'm Adam. Who, who's in the garden? Who's painting the windows? Who's serving the food? Who's cooking the food? Who owns the building? All of that is still intact. So, when we ushered in our new, new South Africa, it even got the name, New South Africa. We don't call it new, it's 21 years old now. <laughs> Not 26. 1990, when Mandela was released. Huh? Is that the margin of our freedom? Okay. I'll mark it from 1994 when we had our first democratic election and when the ANC as a liberation movement was ushered into government without the tools to govern. And um, we had four provinces and before that and all of a sudden we had nine that had five had to be started from scratch. 
Then you look at all the debt that we inherited from apartheid and the fiscus and dividing up that pot. Um, and I'll come to that. And one of our very first exercises, a very critical one, which Pumla put into focus. Pumla, are you here? Um, where our past is <coughs> transsexually <coughs> cut and we put it on the washing line for all to see. And then we took it down, folded it, ironed it, put it in boxes and put it into an archive. And so a lot of the information is actually not that accessible. But we've done that. Some of us have participated in that. And um, well, I'm not too sure if speaking on a public platform is a healing process myself, but I won't go into that. And um, it was a very, very good exercise, but we failed to realize that our struggle was actually led by the, ma the mass democratic movement. The mass democratic movement, led by the youth in particular. And the TRC created an elite class of victims. Some of the 3,000 and some odds went from the, the perpetrator side, got uh, amnesty, and that was it. It was the beginning, it was not the end. It was the beginning of storytelling, not the end. So, let me go to my notes. <laughs> then we had the military that was um, wrapped up in our new democracy. We all had to hand in our arms. There was a process of demobilizing or integrating in the new force. It went relatively smoothly. So we've got a new army that's made up of former liberation soldiers and the old guard, the people who worked in the time of apartheid in the force. Whether there was a re-education, I would imagine, completely done. A police force as well that was, was integrated, also not re-educated around new principles. And that is a continuous process because you can't bring in it, bring people in and expect decades later for this new value system to be inculcated in the new forces as they come in. It's an ongoing process. This whole exercise is an ongoing process. It didn't start and stop, it can't. So, we have a pyramid with largely a white ownership elite on the top with a little massively rich black individuals as well in that little top of the triangle and at the very bottom are the unemployed black masses still to this day. Underneath that and invisible are um, foreign nationals and refugees and silence, asylum seekers who get very little assistance from the state. In South Africa today, 16 million people are getting grants, raising for, ranging in a different amount from, from old persons' um, grants of 1,600 rand a month to child grants of 330 rand a month. So it ranges, and this, this is now a movement, it's progression. But we had a lot of confidence in our new South Africa. When we voted for the first time in 1994, and that was also the first time I voted, there was this hope that with the power to vote and with the abolition of all the laws that were put into a place that were racialized, that life would be better. And now, 21 years later, as you've heard, unfortunately, there's more and more disappointment that that hasn't changed, that hasn't shifted. And so, when Mandela came into power, the first president, our Madiba, our, our loved one, he said, come, come, come to our country. Come, you're welcome. And we have a numbers, and numbers of Africans in our country. Why? Because of the greed of a few and maladministration on the continent and economic meltdown. We have got lots and lots of foreign nationals 
illegal and illegal and asylum seekers. So we have to share the resources and it's the people at the bottom of the run that has to do that. And that's where the tension is. It's a disappointment that the new South Africa hasn't actually created a better life that South Africans deserve. So here we have our problem. That there wasn't mass literacy and numeracy at the beginning of our democracy that empowered people with the tools to, 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 to work, entrepreneurial skills and markets opened. No, we pandered to the international markets to save grace because we're the skunks of the world. And, and so we favoured foreign direct investment in instead of developing our own markets. All of these have been the problems of our country. And this is what we're sitting with. If you look at our stats, um, you know it's 1.3% of the fiscus is spent on military. Well, that's, that's just what it should be. And 8.8% .8 is on health. Psychosocial health is within that budget. Only 4% of that goes actually to psychosocial support and most of it to psychiatry, to institutions. Who is carrying the can? NGOs, actually. And so this is the story that we are having to carry in our new democracy of dealing with the hurt and the pain and the and the and and um, the trauma of the past. But and we all do it differently. I've got lots more to say. And we've already got a message that I've up uh, the time. I work for the Human Rights Media Centre, which honours narrative history, and. Part of what we do is intergenerational dialogues. In fact, we run with the Holocaust Center in Cape Town. The, the educational team is, does the first part because it's a very good springboard to understand systematic racism and, and genocide. And then we take over with the debriefing and we carry on into the afternoon. But I want to say in the South African context, we see intergenerational conflict is passed down from parents to children to grandchildren. That's the, that's the, that's the narrative. But in fact, in our struggle, it was youth-driven, mass democratic movement, and the youth, in fact, caused trauma to the generation above and below. So it's a completely different model that we have to work with. It goes both ways. And um, so there are lots of things in the NGO sector that I could tell you more about what we do. Um, but it's about creating emotional intelligence in our people so that we can embrace and listen to each other and our model is always to bring refugees and South Africans together in projects like the Umoju Wamama project which is a craft cooperative where marginalized women, 50% are refugees, 50% marginalized South Africans who are creating markets for their skills that they've learned from their grandparents, beautiful skills. And so it's that model always that we use in our way we run our work media, the way we do intergenerational work, it is to cross-sect with our society. And then that is the way we are going to... We don't, I mean, here I say that in, in broad terms, but I absolutely mean it. Because it's these big um, types of work, not just medicines. If you look at the cues at the primary health care, you will see that most psychosocial problems are dealt with by medicine and in a medical model because the resources are so overstretched. So we have to deal with it in a different way. All the people that sit in the room have high blood pressure and sugar diabetes. They have to pop their pills and do their thing, but they feel relieved when they leave that room. And so that's what we do and that's what we're passionate about. And it's about how we work together because that's how we're going to make it.